foreign direct investment and India's JVs abroad. Foreign direct investment is that investment which is made to serve the business interests of the investor in a company which is in a different nation distinct from the investor's country of origin. Parent business enterprise and its foreign affiliate are the two sides of the FDI relationship. Together they compromise an MNC. The parent enterprise through its foreign direct investment effort seeks to exercise substantial control over the foreign affiliate company. Control, as defined by the UN, is ownership of greater than or equal to 10% of ordinary shares or access to voting rights in an incorporated firm. For an unincorporated firm, one needs to consider an equivalent criteria. In this lesson, we will discuss various trends, aspects and issues related to foreign direct investment and India's JVs abroad. It follows from previous slide that after studying this lesson, you should be able to understand the meaning and nature of foreign direct investment, describe volume of FDI inflow and outflow, know the nature and extent of JVs abroad. India is the third most attractive foreign direct investment destination in the world, behind China as the number one and the United States as the number two. In 2008, India was ranked number two but slipped to the number three spot given the economic downturn and the surge of investments by Chinese and Indian firms acquiring American companies. The Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion provides official information about India's FDI policy and procedures. Overall, among the emerging economies, India has one of the most liberal and transparent policies on foreign investment. According to the International Trade and Development Division of the Indian government, the country's foreign trade policies have been formulated with a view to invite and encourage FDI. Foreign investment in sectors permitted under the automatic rule does not require any prior approval either by the government or the RBI. Foreign investment in activities not covered under the automatic route requires prior government approval. Approvals of all such pro proposals including composite bids involving foreign investment and foreign technical collaboration are granted on the recommendations of the FIPB. Foreign investment in the retail sector, however, is still restricted under the Indian laws and does not allow FDI into multi-brand retail. Industrial license is required only in the cases where industries retain under compulsory licensing. Manufacture of items reserved for the small-scale sector by larger units when the proposed location attracts local restrictions. In 1991, under the leadership of then Finance Minister Manmohan Singh, the Indian government issued the industrial policy of 1991 that greatly liberalized the country's economy from an agrarian to an industrial one. In August 2009, the Indian government announced it will not be changing the limit on foreign direct investment in the banking and media sectors. Indian law only allows for 74% FDI in private banks and 20% in state-run banks. In the media industry, businesses such as newspapers and periodicals only allow foreign investors to invest by as much as 26%. FDIs can be broadly classified into two types, viz. outward FDIs and inward FDIs. This classification is based on the types of restrictions imposed and the various prerequisites required for these investments. Foreign direct investment, which is inward, is a typical form of what is termed as inward investment. Here, investment of foreign capital occurs in local resources. An outward bound FDI is backed by the government against all types of associated risks. This form of FDI is subject to tax incentives as well as disincentives of various forms. Risk coverage 
provided to the domestic industries and subsidies granted to the local firms stand in the way of outward FDIs, which are also known as direct investments abroad. One of the advantages of foreign direct investment is that it helps in the economic development of the particular country where the investment is being made. This is especially applicable for the economically developing countries. It has also been observed that foreign direct investment has helped several countries when they have faced economic hardships. Foreign direct investment also permits the transfer of technologies. This is done basically in the way of provision of capital inputs. The importance of this factor lies in the fact that this transfer of technology cannot be accomplished by the way of trading goods and services as well as investment of financial resources. It also assists in the promotion of competition within the local input market of a country. The countries that get foreign direct investment from another country can also develop the human capital resources by getting their employees to receive training on the operations of a particular business. The profits that are generated by the foreign direct investments that are made in that country can be used for the purpose of making contributions to the revenues of corporate taxes of the recipient country. Foreign direct investment helps in the creation of new jobs in a particular country. It also helps in increasing the salaries of the workers. Foreign direct investment can also bring in advanced technology and skill set in a country. There is also some scope for new research activities being undertaken. It also opens up the export window that allows these countries the opportunity to cash in on their superior technological resources. It becomes easier for the business entities to borrow finance at lesser rates of interest. The biggest beneficiaries of these facilities are the small and medium-sized business enterprises. The disadvantages of foreign direct investment occur mostly in case of matters related to operation distribution of the profits made on the investment and the personnel. One of the most indirect disadvantages of foreign direct investment is that the economically backward section of the host country is always inconvenienced when the stream of foreign direct investment is negatively affected. The various disadvantages of foreign direct investment are understood where the host country has, has some sort of national secret, something that is not meant to be disclosed to the rest of the world. It has been observed that the defense of a country has faced risks as a result of the foreign direct investment in the country. Foreign direct investment may entail high travel and communication expenses. The differences of language and culture that exist between the country of the investor and the host country could also pose problems in case of foreign direct investment. Yet another major disadvantage of foreign direct investment is that there is a chance that a company may lose out on its ownership to an overseas company. This has often caused many companies to approach foreign direct investment with a certain amount of caution. At times, it has been observed that there is considerable instability in a particular geographic region. This causes a lot of inconvenience to the investor. The size of the market as well as the condition of the host country could be important factors in the case of foreign direct investment. In case the host country is not well connected with the more advanced neighbors, it poses a lot of challenge for the investors. At times it has been observed that the government of the host country are facing problems with foreign direct investment. It has less control over the functioning of the company that is functioning as the wholly owned subsidiary of an overseas company. One of the most important determinants of foreign direct investment is the size as well as the growth prospects of the economy of the country where the foreign direct investment is being made. It is normally assumed that if the country has a big market, it can grow quickly from an economic point of view and it is concluded that the investors would be able to make the most of their investments in that country. In case of foreign direct investments that are based on export, the dimensions of the host country are important as there are opportunities for bigger economies of scale 
as well as spillover effects. The population of a country plays an important role in attracting foreign direct investors to a country. In such cases, the investors are lured by the prospects of a huge customer base. Now, if the country has a high per capita income or if the citizens have reasonably good spending capabilities, then it would offer the foreign direct investors with the scope of excellent performance. The status of the human resources in a country is also instrumental in attracting direct investment from overseas. Inexpensive labor force is also an important determinant of attracting foreign direct investment. It has been observed that if the infrastructural facilities are properly in place in a country, then that country receives a substantial amount of foreign direct investment. If a country has extended its arms to overseas investors and is also able to get access to the international markets, then it stands a better chance of getting higher amounts of foreign direct investment. It has been observed in the recent years that a couple of countries have altered their stance vis-a-vis -vis overseas investment. They have reset their economic policies in order to suit the interests of the overseas investors. These companies have increased the transparency of the legal frameworks in place. This has been done so that the overseas companies can understand the implications of their investment in a particular country and take the appropriate decisions. Foreign direct investment has a major role to play in the economic development of the host country. Over the years, foreign direct investment has helped the economies of the host countries to obtain a launching pad from where they can make further improvements. This trend has manifested itself in the last 20 years. Any form of foreign direct investment pumps in a lot of capital knowledge and technological resources into the economy of a country. The fact that the foreign direct investors have been ab able to play an important role vis-a-vis -vis the economic development of the recipient countries has been due to the fact that these countries have changed their economic stances and have allowed the foreign direct investors to come in and improve their economies. It has often been observed that the economically developing as well as underdeveloped countries are dependent on the economically developed countries for financial assistance that would help them to achieve some amount of economical stability. It has been observed that the foreign direct investment has been able to improve the infrastructural condition of a country. There is ample scope of technological development of country as well. The standard of living of the general public of the host country could be improved as a result of the foreign direct investment made in a country. The health sector of many a recipient country has been benefited by the foreign direct investment. This is where the foreign direct investment can come in handy. It can also assist in helping economically underdeveloped countries build their own research and development bases that can contribute to the technological development of the country. This is a very crucial contribution as most of these countries are not able to perform these functions on their own. At times, foreign direct investment could be provided in the form of technology. Else, the money can come in a country through the foreign direct investment can be utilized to buy or import technology from other countries. Foreign corporate and individual investment in India, termed collectively as foreign direct investment, FDI, when it relates to control or ownership of a company in India, takes one of two routes, automatic route or automatic approval and FIPB approval. Automatic route or automatic approval requires no prior approval from FDI. Post facto filing of data relating to the investment made with the Reserve Bank of India is for record and data purposes. This route is available to all sectors or activities that do not have a sector cap. The Foreign Investment Promotion Board FIPB approves investment proposals. Where the proposed shareholding is above the prescribed sector caps, where the activity belongs to that small list of sectors where FDI is either not allowed or where it is mandatory that proposals be routed through the FIPB.
The Indian companies can directly invest outside India by the way of contribution to the capital or subscription to the memorandum of association of a foreign entity signifying a long-term interest in the overseas entity. It involves setting up a joint venture JV or a wholly owned subs subsidiary WOS abroad and does not include portfolio investment. A joint venture abroad means a foreign concern formed, registered or incorporated in a foreign country in accordance with the laws and regulations of that country and in which investment has been made by an Indian entity. While a wholly owned subsidiary abroad means a foreign concern formed, registered or incorporated in a foreign country in accordance with the laws and regulations of that country and whose entire capital is owned by an Indian entity. At the time of the initial decision, the Indian government seems to have been aware of the fact that private investors could create problems for India since national interests and private interests need not necessarily co coincide. Till 1991, India's economic integration with the rest of the world was very limited, but the new economic policy and the liberalization measures so introduced made way for the globalization of Indian businesses. Earlier, exports were a predominant way of expanding business abroad and hence the emphasis was on export promotion strategies with restrictions on cash outflows so as to conserve our foreign exchange reserves. But over the years, it has been realized that for expansion and growth of Indian companies, it is necessary that they increase their share in the world market not only by exporting their products but also by acquiring overseas assets and establishing their presence abroad. Accordingly, the policy for outward capital flows has evolved, marked by phased liberalization. In numbers, the IGVs are concentrated in the Southeast Asian countries. Out of the out of the 147 IGVs in operation, 61 are located in this region alone, 41%. In other regions, the number of operating IJVs are more or less evenly distributed. For America and Oceania, the percentage share was 4 and 3 respectively. Even if one goes by the number of projects that are being implemented, approximately 20% each of the total are located in the Southeast Asia, Africa, South Asia and Europe regions. If one goes by the size of the equity capital, instead of the number one finds that the degree of concentration of IGVs in the Southeast Asia is more pronounced. That is, more than half of the overall investments under the IGVs are accounted for by Southeast Asia alone. Similarly, Africa claims nearly 37% of investments with only 16% of IGVs. The combined share of two regions in the operating IGVs is nearly 9 tenths of the capital investment. One finds a slightly better dispersal of equity in the projects that are still under implementation. In the case of these IJVs, Southeast Asia, Africa and South Asia put together account for 80% of the total equity. The projects under implementation account for nearly one-fifth of the total Indian equity. Even if one looks at the total Southeast Asia and Africa account for nearly 85% of the total Indian equity. In all, India's joint ventures are spread over 35 countries, both developing and developed, number-wise, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Nigeria and UK, occupy the top five positions respectively. That is, two countries from Southeast Asia and one each from South Asia, Africa and Europe. The five countries account for nearly 50% of the total number of IJVs. In term of equity participation, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Senegal and Kenya occupy the top five positions. Nearly 65% of the total Indian equity is shared by the five countries. Now let us check if we have understood the various concepts discussed in this lesson clearly. In outward FDI, investment of foreign capital occurs in local resources. Right or wrong? Wrong. Inward FDI is the local capital which is being invested in some foreign resource. Right or wrong? Wrong. 
The abbreviation JV stands for Joint Ventures. Right or wrong? Right. Before we end, let us briefly revise what we have studied till so far. Foreign direct investment is that investment which is made to serve the business interests of the investor in a company, which is in a different nation distinct from the investor's country of origin. FDIs can be broadly classified into two types, outward FDIs and inward FDIs. This classification is based on the types of restrictions imposed and the various prerequisites required for these investments. As per data released by a global consultancy firm, cross-border FDI flow increased by 5.1% the world over in 2007 and stood at US dollar 947 billion. Estimates put the number of FDI projects announced in 2007 at 11,574. One of the advantages of foreign direct investment is that it helps in the economic development of the particular country where the investment is being made. One of the most important determinants of foreign direct investment is the size as well as the growth prospects of the economy of the country where the foreign direct investment is being made. The policy of the Government of India is to strive to maximize the developmental impact and spin-offs of FDI. While the Government encourages and indeed welcomes FDI in all the sectors where it is permitted, we are especially looking for large FDI inflows in the development of infrastructure, technological upgradation of Indian industry through greenfield investments in manufacturing and in projects having the potential for creating employment opportunities on a large scale. We also invite investments in setting up special economic zones and establishing manufacturing units therein. The first case of an IJV abroad was the textile mill established by the builders in Ethiopia. This venture commenced operation in 1964. But the process of Indian capital going abroad gained momentum only during the 70s. The first policy in the form of guidelines governing overseas direct investment was issued in 1969 by the government of India. Such guidelines were subsequently revised in 1986, 1992 and 1995. Liberalization of the policy on Indian investment overseas was first undertaken in 1992 on the recommendations of the Kalyan Banerjee Committee. 